So happy to see you each today as we come back to Isaiah. Hopefully we can do chapter 34 and 35. The two actually go together. One is um, dealing with, like it says on our paper there, the destruction of the Gentile world power. And the other one is the Lord speaking to his own people that when he comes back the second time, he is going to restore the kingdom to Israel. All right. His people will have a place again, and he will be dealing with them again. So I'm going to ask Sophia to read the first three verses of chapter 34. This is quite a horrific chapter, and I think we need to take it to heart because those who just think of God as a God of love, they need to know uh, there is a verse in, I think, Romans that says, behold, the goodness and the severity of God. There's two sides, his holiness um, and his love. Uh, his love is one thing, but if people don't accept his holiness and accept the grace and love that he offers, there's nothing left to them but the severity of God, the, um, the anger, the wrath, and so forth. That will not come until the last person has opened their heart to receive the Lord, when God knows that no more are going to accept him, that they just are against him, then, of course, it will turn into his wrath on them. Uh, let's read those first three verses first. Isaiah 34, verse 1. Come near ye nations to hear, and hearken ye people. Let the earth hear and all that is there in the world, and all that comes forth of it. Verse 2, For the indignation of the Lord is upon all nations, and his fury upon all their armies. He hath utterly destroyed them. He hath delivered them to the slaughter. Verse 3, Their slain also shall be cast out, and their stink shall come up out of their carcasses, and the mountains shall be melted with their blood. Well, it really speaks of a terrible carnage, all right, a terrible slaughter that is going to take place. This is not against God's people, but this is against the world. It says very clearly, come near ye nations. You better hear, you better listen what I have to tell you, all right. Uh, this is to the earth and everything that belongs in it, the world and all that are in there, all right? Because we're going to see the indignation of the Lord. And as it says in verse two, uh, this isn't the love of God. Right now is the day of grace and God's love is poured out to and made available to every nation in the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So now is that time. But people don't want it. They go against it. They fight against it. It's getting worse and worse. And there's going to be nothing left but God's indignation when the last one finally, the last Gentile, that is, accepts the Lord and no more are going to accept the Lord. It's not just uh, this indignation of God is not just to a certain part of the world. It's on all nations. And it says his indignation and then it calls it his fury. Fury is just anger that is uh, overflows its boundaries, all right? 
all their armies, all right? And he, it's God himself. He has utterly destroyed them, all right? He has delivered them to the slaughter. And, and it says that, you know, their slain will be cast out and the stink is going to come. That means there, there's no way, no chance or no opportunity for them to be buried. There are so many of them and they're just going to lay there until they rot. And um, we, we, see, we will see later, of course, it's called the Supper of the Great God which is prepared for the uh, birds and the beasts. They will feed on the dead carcasses till they can't eat any more. And, and yet there will be more there that, um, you know, is left uneaten and nothing done with it. So they, it becomes just totally rotten. I've put here on the notes, all right, the Battle of Armageddon. Uh, this is going to take place when the nations get together and want to fight against Jerusalem, all right? So when Jesus comes back the second time, it's not only he's going to come against the nations of the world, all right, but it is to deliver Israel, his people. All right, Let, let's read verse four through seven now. Isaiah 34, verse four through seven. And all the hosts of heaven shall be dissolved and the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll and all their hosts shall fall down and the leaf falleth off from the vine, and as a falling fig from the tree, fig tree. For the sword shall be bathed in heaven. Behold, it shall come down upon Edomir, and upon the people of my curse to judgment. The sword of the Lord is filled with blood. It is made fat with fatness, and with the blood of lambs and goats, and with the fat of kidneys of rams. For the Lord hath a sacrifice in Bozra, and a great slaughter in the land of Edomia. And the unicorns shall come down with them, and the bullocks with the bulls, and their land shall be soaked with blood, and their dust made fat with fatness. Yes. So, all right. Um, God is warning ahead of time, all right? The indignation of the Lord is against all nations, against people of those nations, all right? And, you know, he wants them, as I mentioned earlier, to come near, to hear, and, and to yeah, listen what is being said. And I just want to mention for you and me, all right, at the time that we are living, actually the stage is set for the temple to be rebuilt. The stage is set for a world dominating confederation of nations, all right? The stage is set for a political and economic Superman to show up, all right? The stage is set for the kind of false religion the Bible says is going to characterize that last day, all right? And the stage has been set for the kind of economic system that's been predicted for the last days. The stage is set for the end time scenario that the Bible says will happen, all right? And we see again, this is a warning to all nations. Now is the day of salvation. Today is the still the day of salvation. It's the day of grace. It's the day that people can come to God. But 
there, when that last Gentile is uh, born again and accepts the Lord and God himself through foreknowledge knows that there's going to be no more, uh, then it's, things are going to turn. Of course, Jesus will come first and catch away his waiting bride. That is before he actually comes that second time. And uh, when he comes that second time, uh, when we go down there to verse five, it says it's on there. The nations, this is number two, all right, on all their armies, he is going to utterly destroy them. They have been delivered to the slaughter. All right. And the stench of the unburied carcasses is going to be terrible. The mountains, these are the mountains around Jerusalem because they're going to come uh, via that way to surround Jerusalem. All right. But we just read now, starting with verse five, my sword is going to be bathed in heaven. So when this day of wrath comes, it is not only going to touch earth, but it's going to touch heaven. It's going to have to do with the heavenly powers that are in rebellion against God. Sometimes we wonder why God hasn't destroyed Satan, but God is still using Satan, making use of his deception, his lies, and so forth. All right, but the day is coming when he is going to cleanse the heavens as well as the earth. All right, it says all the host of heaven will be dissolved. Uh, that's the stars. And all of that is going to be touch just like in the day when God destroyed the earth through that worldwide flood it was all over the earth it wasn't just one place everywhere was underwater and so it's going to come a day when God is going to destroy um, heaven and earth it won't all be at the very same time, but uh, it will be in the same era of time. Sh shall I put it like that? All right. Uh, number three on your notes, God's sword of judgment is going to be filled with blood, which is the results of the wrath of God. It's bathed in heaven. Wickedness and heavenly places will be cast down dissolving satanic systems and then it tells us that it comes upon Idumea or Edom the people of my curse and I put it here very clearly uh, Edom and Idumea represents man after the flesh uh, we're going to see uh, under this sea um, Malachi one, two to five. Let, let's turn there. Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament. Chapter one, uh, verses, in fact, um, start with one. It says two, but start with one and read through five, will you? Okay, Malachi 1, verse 1 to 5. The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. All right, so this is written by the prophet Malachi to God's nation, those that love him, those that follow him. All right, it's it's the when it says the burden, uh, that's what a prophecy was considered in those days. It was heavy, heavy on the prophet till he spoke it out and 
gave forth the word of the Lord. All right, verse two. Verse two, I have loved you, saith the Lord. Yet ye say, wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I loved Jacob, and I hated Esau, and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Okay, stop just a minute here. Uh, this is when the nation of Israel, not every one of them, that there was a remnant. There's always been a remnant that loved the Lord. And in spite of the fact that the whole nation uh, kind of rebels, goes against, you know, when God says, I have loved you, they respond, uh, wherein have you loved us? How have you loved us? All right. They, they doubt it because they went into captivity, not acknowledging that the captivity was because of their own sin right so god answers and he uses um jacob and esau they were um brothers or in fact they were twins and uh he says esau was jacob's brother he was the older brother all right he came out as the twins he came out as the firstborn, but he said, I loved Jacob. Now, Jacob's name is deceiver. In other words, every one of us, when we're born into this world, we're born as a sinner. All right. But some of us want God and some of us don't. Desiring God doesn't make us a child of God, but it certainly has a groundwork for God to work in. Isn't that right? He said, I, between the two twins, <clears throat> I love Jacob. Yes, his name meant deceiver, but I saw in him a desire for the spiritual realm, but I hated Esau, and therefore I was against Esau. All right. Uh, you remember the story how Esau came in from hunting and he was so tired and weary and Jacob, who was a mama's boy, uh, lived in the tent, did not, not like his brother who was an outdoorsman, who was a hunter and went out um, all over the place hunting animals and creatures. He wasn't like, they were totally different in their outlook. And um, Jacob had sowed pottage, red bean, red bean pottage. And he was a good cook and the stuff smelt good. If you've ever eaten uh, red bean porridge here in Singapore, you know, especially if it has coconut milk in it. Whoa, it is so delicious. Well, I imagine it was similar to something like that. And um, Esau says, you know, let me have some of it. I'm ready to die. Uh, you're not going to die if you don't get one meal. But he really, he wanted that pottage so much. And uh, because he was the firstborn, he had a special inheritance. He would get twice the inheritance. He would be given special treatment, spiritual treatment and spiritual inheritance being the firstborn. And Jacob said to him, well, I'm not going to just give it to you for free. If you really want it, uh, you have to buy it from me. Uh, you have something I want. I have something you want. So if you sell me your birthright, which was a spiritual heritage, and that's when Esau said, I'm ready to die. What good is this spiritual stuff? That's when you need the spiritual before you die. But he wanted food so badly <clears throat> that the Bible said, he despised his birthright and he sold it 
for a mess of pottage. That's where Edom came from. Edom means red. All right. So from then on, Esau is known as Edom, and the place he dwelt was Edom. All right. Um, so between the two, God chose Jacob because he wanted the spiritual, and Esau chose the natural, to the everyday life, the natural, the now. But when he came against Esau in verse 3, laid his mountains and heritage waste, all right, when God allowed that to happen. <clears throat> this is what Edom said. We are impoverished. That means we have been made poor. But we're going to return and build those desolate places. In other words, such rebellion, such self-will. It was God who allowed them to be destroyed <clears throat> and impoverished and lose the battle. But they had such a strong self-will, they said, we're going to rise up and we're going to rebuild. All right. In verse 4, God says, and he's called the Lord of hosts. All the armies, whether of heaven, earth, angelic armies, what kind of armies they are, God says, I am commander-in-chief of all of them and he's speaking as the commander-in-chief here and he says they shall build but I will throw down I don't care how much they're determined to do their own thing I'm against them and whatever they do I'm going to pull it down and friend let's learn from this our God never changes he hates the flesh. Now he created man, but he did not create sin. He warned man not to eat of the knowledge, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He said, don't eat of that tree. But man did eat of that tree. And the result was sin came into the world contaminated all mankind that was born thereafter. And even though God has made a way for man to come back to him, God hates sin. And therefore, man that is contaminated with sin, which is the flesh, the old nature, natural man, God hates it. God's going to fight against it. He is not going to accept it. He has made a way of salvation. And if man will accept God's way of salvation, believe God's word by what he said, he sent his only begotten son to redeem mankind. Uh, it's by faith. It's not by our works. God hates anything. He says they shall build. I will throw down. And God says in verse four, you shall call them. That means man after the flesh, the border of wickedness. Wickedness is not just being a sinner. Wickedness, we learn from Psalms 50 very clearly. It's somebody that knows the things of God, somebody that even claims the things of God with his mouth, but his lifestyle is sinful and terrible and against God. It's self-centered, living for self, going our selfish way. That is called wickedness, all right? So the man after the flesh is called the border of wickedness and the people against whom the Lord hath indignation forever. God is never going to change. He is unchangeable. Amen. 
all right? And he has told us very clearly, he hates the flesh. He will not back it up. He will not help it out, but he does offer a way of salvation, all right? Um, your eyes shall see, and you will say the Lord will be magnified from the border of Israel. So between uh, those that go their own way and those that choose God's way, God is going to go for uh, because Israel, if you remember, Jacob meant deceiver. And Jacob deceived uh, in many ways. But once he met God and later he wrestled with God all night and God changed his name from Jacob to Israel, which means a prince with God. Amen. So when it refers to Israel, it is referring to a born again believer who has met with God, been changed by God, and the name deceiver has been changed into Israel. All right. Um, so let's go over to our notes again which is God's sword of judgment is coming on sea, Idumea or Edom, all right? The people of my curse, representing man after the flesh, doing things his own way apart from God, all right? Now, verse six and seven, um, I'm going to have, Sister, read that again to us, 6 and 7. Okay. Isaiah 34, verse 6 and 7. The sword of the Lord is filled with blood. It is made fat with fatness, and with the blood of lambs and goats, and with the fat of the kidneys of rams. For the Lord hath a sacrifice in Bosra, and a great slaughter in the land of Idumea. And the unicorns shall come down with them and the bullocks with the bulls, and their land shall be soaked with blood, and their dust made fat with fatness. Yeah, so as it says here, under D, all right, um, C is just man after the flesh. But here, when it's talking about he has a sacrifice in Basra, it's on fleshly religious formality all right <clears throat> Basra was uh, there were <clears throat> two parts to Edom and and one one part of it the capital was Basra right uh, and yes they had religious formality but they did not serve the true and the living God so let's look at this um it says the sword of the Lord is filled with blood. He is not only going to come against those that are just going their own way, but those, all right, that have religious formality. They go through all kind of, it looks like they're so religious, but they have never made Jesus their Lord and Savior, all right? There's going to be a great slaughter in the land of Ijamia, all right? And then when it talks about, <coughs> no, let's do these two, Isaiah 63, <coughs> verses one to six. Isaiah 63, verse one to six. Who is this that cometh from Edom with dyed garments from Bosra? This that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of strength. Of I that righteousness mighty to save. Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel, and thine garments like him that treadeth in thy fat? I have trodden the winepress alone, and of the people there was none with me, for I will tread them in mine anger, 
and trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment. For the day of vengeance is in mine heart, and the year of my redeemed is come. And I looked, and there was none to help, and I wondered, <coughs> there was none to uphold. <coughs> For mine overcome brought salvation unto me, and my fury it upheld me. And I will tread down the people in mine anger and make them drunk in my fury. And I will bring down their strength to this. Now this, we haven't reached this one yet. This is at the end of the book of Isaiah, but this is a prophecy about Jesus. Right now, Jesus is the savior of the world. God sent him into this world to save us, to be our substitute, to love us, all right? But if you remember the parable that Jesus told when he called his husbandmen together, all right, and uh, gave them each a, a unit of, you know, um, a talent and said, go and use it and make for me they were his servants then when the day came that he came back from his long journey uh his servants were called before him but at that day that he gave out those talents his citizens said we don't want him ruling over us we hate him we don't want him and they rebelled against him. They did not want to be his servant. So on the day of accountability, when he checked with his servants how they had used the talent that he had given to them, had they earned extra for the kingdom of God, when it was all over and he had given the rewards out, he said, where are those people that said they didn't want me to rule over them, bring them, and kill them. That was a parable pointing down to the end of time, that if we want to be his servants, serve him, love him, work for him, we will be well rewarded, all right, and we will be saved. But if we don't want those that don't want, all right, they're going to have to go through the Lord's day of vengeance. And this uh, that we just read in Isaiah 63, 1 to 6. Who is this that cometh from Edom? Remember I told you, Edom represents man in the flesh. The world going their own way, doing their own thing. And it says his, he, his dyed garments from Basra, from the very capital down, all right? Uh, and, and that verse one says, I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Yeah, he is the righteous savior of the world and he was mighty to save, but they didn't want him. And so the question is asked in verse two, how come your apparel is so red and your garments like him that treadeth the winepress. You know, you, they would stomp on the grapes with their feet and the blood, not the blood, the juice of the grapes would spurt out and splash out and all over them. They were evidently uh, red grapes, all right? And so, but it's a picture and a type of God's vengeance when he kills and destroys and um, massacres, all right, the world that didn't want him. And in verse three, Jesus says here, I have trodden that winepress alone. It, God, it just like God sent Jesus alone to save us, Jesus alone will be the one that brings the wrath of God, all right? 
And um, it, it's a picture showing that the instead of grapes, it's going to be people and their blood is going to be splattered all over. He said, it's the day of vengeance and the year of my redeemed. In other words, I'm going to take vengeance on the world. I'm going to get rid of them and the way they treated my children. I'm going to pay them back. All right. I'm going to fight against them. But it's also going to be the year of my redeemed. I'm going to redeem those on earth that have chosen me, that have suffered at the hands of the world. I'm going to come to help them. And no one is going to be with him. He's going to do it alone, even though when he comes, uh, it's really told us in Revelation 19, all right, 11 to 21. But he said, I'm going to bring down their strength. I'm going to tread down the people in my anger. I'll make them drunk. That means where they don't know what's happening. All right. And Jesus alone, when it says the sword of the Lord in those other verses, that sword we're going to see, let's turn to Revelation 19, comes out of the very mouth of Jesus. Revelation 19, 11 to 21. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Okay, let's stop just a minute. When we were in Isaiah 63.1, you remember the end of verse 1, he says, I am righteousness. It's talking about the same person. One was written 700 years before Uh, Jesus came to this world through the prophet Isaiah, and Revelation is written after Jesus comes, dies, and is resurrected, and then sent his angel to tell us what was going to happen. And um, this one on the white horse is called Faithful, his name faithful because he's been faithful to God through thick and thin he's called true because he said I am the truth all right and in righteousness he he's not judging out of jealousy out of his own anger but he is judging righteous judgment according to God the Father and he's making war, all right? Verse 12. Verse 12, his eyes were a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Yeah, let's stop. So verse 12, on his head were many crowns. Do you know what it says? When we receive our crowns of righteousness, everyone that has accepted the Lord, been true to the Lord, we will receive a crown of righteousness. It's God's righteousness. But then we're going to take our crowns and we're going to throw them at his feet and say, we don't deserve it. You did everything, Jesus. And so it says <clears throat> on his head were many crowns. And then there's a name written that no one knows. So we don't know because he hasn't become that person yet. All right. That is, as yet, he has not fulfilled Isaiah 63, nor has he fulfilled. Um, Revelation 19, all right, so that name that will be given to him by God, no one knows, but he's clothed in a vesture dipped in blood. He gave his own blood 
all right? And um, his, the name that we know is the word of God, okay, 14. 14. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Okay, stop. The armies in heaven followed him, all right? So this means the overcomers. We learned that in the, when we studied the book of Revelation, that when we become overcomers, then we become part of his army. We also have white horses clothed in fine linen. Linen, we know from scripture, is the righteousness of the saints. White and clean. They kept their garments clean. They didn't get them spotted. They kept them clean. All right. And so when he comes out of heaven on his white horse, we will follow him on white horses. Though everything will be done by him, we are one with him. Can I put it like that? Okay, verse 15. 15. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of the almighty God. Yeah. Out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword. It's a two-edged sword. One side was, you know, to bring healing, blessing, but these people didn't want it. They get the other side of the sword. It's very sharp. It's out of his mouth. So it's not something he wields with the hand. The sword of the spirit is God's word. So Jesus will come and he will speak the word, all right? And if he speaks, die. If he speaks, be destroyed. Whatever he speaks, it will take place. He doesn't have to do it physically, all right? And with the very sword of his mouth, he will actually tread this wine press of God's anger and wrath. And, and destroy all of the hosts of this earth. 16. 16. And he hath on his vesture and on his tie a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Oh. 17. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and, the, and of them that sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free and bound, both small and great. <clears throat> and I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worship his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. And the remnant was slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse which sought proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. There's other verses in the Old Testament that tell us the beasts of the earth, not only the fowls of heaven, but the beasts of the earth will be filled. It's going to be a terrible carnage. All This is in the end time, after the Lord has caught away his bride, all right. And the Antichrist, because the Antichrist cannot come to this world until um, Jesus has caught away his bride. The bride of Jesus Christ is holding back right now the influence and the power uh, and, and the, you know, the sway of things are bad, but they would be much worse if 
all the bride of Christ suddenly is taken away, you, you will see that the world will suddenly become just terrible. All right. And, and that's what's actually going to happen. So the Antichrist will be here on this earth. It's going to be during that great tribulation time. Many people will turn away from uh, the things that they have learned and out of fear, out of wanting to save their own skin, out of admiration. There's all different reasons why they will follow the Antichrist, all right? Um, but it says when Jesus comes that second time, all right, it's with his sword, that sword, the word spoken out of his mouth. He just speaks the word and Antichrist and the false prophet who were so powerful and miracles were prevalent and all kind of signs and wonders that had taken place. And yet when Jesus comes back, he'll just speak the word and, and those are cast into the lake fire that means not into death itself but spiritual death the spirits that were in them that caused them all right will take them straight into the lake of fire all right and all those that are left 21 the remnant will be slain with the sword of him on the horse. He just speaks the word and this terrible carnage takes place, all right? Let's go back again to our um, Isaiah 34. six and seven. We just finished six, all right? Seven is the unicorns, okay? Uh, unicorn, and I put there the wild ox, all right? Unicorns shall come down with them, the bullocks with the bulls. Their land will be soaked with blood. Their dust made fat with fatness. All right, um, the unicorn is the wild ox representing the nature of the people, wild, undisciplined, rebellious. Bullocks are the domesticated animal. The unicorn, the wild animal. The bullock is the domesticated, outward show of service, outward show of religious activity but the land will be soaked with blood. It is speaking of the tremendous slaughter that is going to take place. Um, I think this is a good place for us to stop and take our 10 minute break. And when we come back, um, we'll start with B. We've finished all of A. talking about the Battle of Armageddon, the destruction of the Gentile world power, all right? And when we come back, we'll take up the desolation following the disaster. Okay, it is now 9.52. We will come back at five minutes past 10. 10.05, 10 10.05. <clears throat> Okay, let's come back again. And <clears throat> before we start with B, uh, I had underlined some things uh, that went with A, all right? Uh, talking about Edom and um, God's dealing with, I, I thought this was quite interesting, some of these things I'm going to read to you, all right? It says the Edomites, were near neighbors to Israel <clears throat> and often bitter rivals. 
they rejoiced whenever the people of Judah or Israel were afflicted. So Isaiah focuses on the judgment that will come against Edom, using them as a single example of the large judgment that will come upon all the nations. Edom was a sister nation to Israel, but it hated Israel more than any other nation. Throughout all of history, we see a burning hatred of Edom against Israel. <clears throat> it is for this reason that Edom is frequently presented as a representative of all the nations that hated the Jews. <clears throat> Edom had derided and attacked Judah for centuries, but now God would avenge this hateful attitude that is so characteristic of the world's ways. And I, I think it's just a picture and a type of, you know, the kingdom of darkness against the kingdom of light. Such a hatred, such a jealousy. Uh, I heard a testimony just this morning early. My youngest daughter, the one that wrote the books, she's in a conference and there, one of their speakers is a lady also in her latter years. I don't know if she's late 80s or early 90s. She wasn't exactly sure. But she told this story of how um, just a few years ago, she went to help her son um, start a church in Tennessee, I believe it was. <coughs> and went to a very, very uh, poor area of Tennessee and um, a bad area. In other words, it was filled with slums and things like that. And there was a man in that area. He literally hated this woman, all right? She was a woman preacher, the, the mother of the man who was starting the work, elderly woman. And um, she was telling them how, you know, secular psychology tells us that we have to uh, put borders. We need to have borders of protection and you know, don't just let people walk all over you. She said that really is not uh, scriptural because these borders become walls where, you know, we're protecting ourselves, but it doesn't allow the love of God to flow through us to them. And she told about this man, he just hated her. He did everything he could to drive her out of that place, to get her to get discouraged and go. He lied about her, ruined her reputation, stole things, you know, and, and was just downright mean and horrid. And one day she was alone and he comes and so angry. And he said, why are you still here? Why haven't you left? Um, you know, he knew everything he had done. And um, she said, because Jesus loves you, that's why. And I'm not leaving. Jesus loves you. It doesn't matter what you say and do. I just want you to know Jesus loves you. And suddenly, before she had a chance to even know what had happened, he just leaped on her and grabbed her by the throat and began to choke her. And, and she said that the, she started seeing stars uh, and, and she was thinking this is probably gonna be the end as he was choking her throat and, and the air was going out of her, but somehow she managed while he was choking her like that, uh, words came out of her mouth 
even if you kill me, I want you to know Jesus loves you. And he dropped his hands, fell down on his knees, and he started to weep and cry. And he said, he, she said, he cried out and asked God to forgive him and opened his heart to the Lord and became a follower of Jesus Christ. So I, I just thought that was a good example, but it's not an example. It's an example of the hatred they have, but this is still the day of grace. And God used that in a means whereby he turned around and was able to come to himself. But Edom here, as it says, uh, represents the rest of the world that is so against the Jew. And you'll notice all over, uh, it's only those that are truly Christians that have a love for Israel. Every, even though Israel has done so much for the world, I'm not even talking about those that love God, just Israel as a nation. So many of their inventions are, uh, the rest of the world uses them, but they hate Israel and it's really a demonic thing, all right? <clears throat> so it said that the sword of the Lord is filled with blood. All right. The indignation of the Lord finds its final fulfillment in the battle of Armageddon when they all gather together <clears throat> on the mountains outside of Israel to come in and take over. And it's going to become a very terrible, bloody affair. Would you read for us um, Revelation 14? 20 please okay revelations 14 verse 20 and the wine press was trodden without the city and blood came out of the wine press even unto the horse bridles by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs so, you know, I've told you before uh, of this description. Of course, when blood comes into the ground, it just soaks into the ground. But it is showing us and telling us, had that blood not soaked into the ground, this is actually how much uh, carnage takes place, how much blood is shed. The height of the river of blood that comes from those dead bodies is up to the horse's bridle. That means that thing in his mouth. And you know, the horse's legs are, very, you, you cannot just climb onto a horse. You, you have to be helped onto the horse. Uh, it's way too tall. And, and so it's showing us how high the, the mouth of the horse, all right, that's the height and 200 miles in length, all right, uh, of that much blood just flowing. But of course, it soaks into the ground, so it won't be a river of blood. But if it were a river, this is the description of it. Now let's come over here to um, verse eight to 15, so starting on 49b. The desolation following this disaster and the reasons for the judgment. Isaiah 34, verse um, 8. For it is the day of the Lord's vengeance and the year of recompenses for the controversy of Zion. And the streams thereof shall be turned into peach and the dust thereof into brimstone, and the land thereof shall become burning pitch. It shall not be quenched night nor day, and the smoke thereof shall go up forever. From generation to generation, it shall lie waste. None shall pass through it forever and ever. But the cormorant and beaten shall possess it, the owl also and the raven shall dwell in it, and he shall stretch out upon it 
the line of confusion and the stones of emptiness. They shall call the nobles thereof to the kingdom, but none shall be there, and all her princes shall be nothing. And thorns shall come out in her palaces, nettles and brambles in the for fortresses thereof, and it shall be an inhabited and habitation of dragons, and a court for owls. The wild beasts of the desert shall also meet the wild beasts of the island, and the satyr shall cry to his fellow, the screech owl also shall rest there, and find, her, find for herself a place of rest. There shall the great owl make her nest and lay, and hatch, and gather under her shadow. There shall the vultures also be gathered, every one with her mate. Okay, so um, as it says on your pa um, page 49, B1, the reasons for the judgment, it's the day of the Lord's vengeance, all right? It, it's a terrible thing and um, many, feel that this is pointing down to the time of the great tribulation. <clears throat> Part of the tribulation is under the Antichrist. He brings terrible tribulation, but part of it is from God himself, just like in the days of Egypt, when God sent those plagues to destroy different areas and lands and people and so forth, uh, that they were things that God ordained, all right? And, and so it's going to be under the great tribulation. Much of the earth <clears throat> will be destroyed in many places so that only wild beasts <clears throat> can live there, all right? <clears throat> there will be unparalleled ecological disaster. And before Jesus Christ returns at the end of the Great Tribulation, one third of the Earth's vegetation, one third of the oceans, one third of the fresh waters will be destroyed and unusable. All right. Um, let, let's look at what we see up here. The day of the Lord's vengeance. We're going to turn now to Jeremiah. You know, the Bible tells us in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every uh, word be established. So we find that God tells about these things in different places. We are in the book of Isaiah, which I keep telling you is uh, 700 years before Jesus was even born. All right. Now we're going to look into Jeremiah. It tells about it. Um, Malachi told about it. Um, Revelation tells us about it. It's in many different places. We see it from different angles. Friends, just believe it. It is true. It is coming to pass. Heaven and earth will pass away but God's word will never pass away. It will come to pass. Let, let's turn right now to Jeremiah verse uh, chapter 25. Jeremiah 25 verse um, 31 to 33. A noise shall come even to the ends of the earth, for the Lord hath a controversy with the nations. He will plead with all flesh. He will give them that are wicked to the sword, saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Behold, evil shall go forth from nation to nation, and a whole wind shall be raised up from the coasts of the earth. And the slain of the Lord shall be at that day, from one end of the earth even unto the other end of the earth. They shall not be lamented, neither gathered nor buried. They shall be dung upon the ground. Yeah, so this is uh, God's controversy with the nations, all right? It's the year of 
recompenses. And it tells us very clearly it's for the controversy of Zion, all right? The way that God's people, not just Israel, yes, it is going to point because at that day, the only ones really that are going to be God's people will be uh, in Israel. And God is going to take them back to himself again. But throughout the ages, it's been the way that the world has treated. Do you know how many martyrs there have been? Do you know how many uh, Christians and God's people have been tortured and tormented and treated badly? And we wonder, does God see? Does God care? Does God do anything? This is going to be what it's all about, all right? Um, as it says here, the slain of the Lord, I'm in uh, Jeremiah, is from one end of the earth to the other end of the earth. It's a worldwide thing. It is not just going to be located in one small area. It's going to cover it. And it says the dead, those that are slain of the Lord, and it's by the sword that comes out of Jesus' mouth. All right, they won't be lamented. Nobody's going to cry for them. They won't be gathered. They won't be buried. But they will be like dung upon the ground, just left there to rot. All right. It, it's going to be a terrible thing, a horrific thing. All right. I need to get back to Isaiah. Um The destruction is everlasting. Well, when I read this brimstone, burning pitch, uh, the fire not quenched night and day, what this tells me is because when prophecy is given, it doesn't just take minute details and one by one. No, it, it just gives you this overall picture. And I think it's showing us very clearly that what starts on earth is going to end, they're going to end up in an eternity of damnation is what that's trying to tell us, all right? Their smoke shall go up forever from generation to generation. Um, it, just, just like we read in the book of Revelation, the antichrist and the false prophet will be cast directly into the lake of fire. But the others, it will be stages, all right? They go into death, from death they, it, and it enters hell. And then later after hell comes the judgment. So this is merely showing from the beginning right down to the end, all right? God's anger, God's vengeance starts here on this earth it will end up an everlasting judgment that never will end. And when it says the description of the desolation, the creatures of the night shall possess, and I've written them down here, all right, the cormorant, the bittern, the owl, the raven. Uh, it will become a habitation of dragons. That is what the end of this life and this world is. All right, the satire, the screech owl, the great owl, make nests, lay young, hatch, and multiply. All right. The birds of prey shall dwell there, vultures. All right. Uh, would you read for us Revelation 18, 2, please? Revelation 18, 2. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and is become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. 
Yeah. Well, when it talks about Babylon the Great, all right, it's talking about this world, capital of this world, the kingdom of darkness that is ruled over this world from the heavenly spheres, all right, ru ruling down, all right. Uh, but when God finishes judging the Gentile world powers, that have been ruling this earth, not according to God's plans, not according to, and you know, the book of Daniel is a good example of it, of Nebuchadnezzar and um, how he takes all the credit to himself. And most of the world rulers have been like that. It's their lust for power, uh, their lust to conquer and, uh, and it's all for selfish reasons, all right? But when God in that final day is going to destroy this earth and destroy the powers of this earth, then nothing is left for humanity, but rather a habitation of demons for every unclean spirit, every hold of unclean bird all right and, and it's called the line of confusion they are stones of emptiness when god first created they were called stones of fire all right they had his nature in them but these stones are stones of emptiness no fire no life no beauty all right because they chose to go their own way. Now, before we uh, go down to the last two verses, I want us to go over to this next page. All right. Uh, I made a supplemental note for Isaiah uh, and for this portion of scripture from 11 to 15. Th chapter 34 verses 11 to 15 which we've already read all right but i took these different creatures that were written there and i went back to deuteronomy and i found the types of the unclean and unacceptable uh birds and uh, that's in deuteronomy 14 11 to 20 all right uh, I just listed it here. The birds, that which moves in the spiritual realm, it represents influences, whether good or bad. The clean birds are not specified here. There are 21 mentioned as unclean in that 11 to 20, all right, there are three groups of seven, seven in a group, seven being the number of completion, three representing the unholy trinity, that which would attack body, soul, and spirit, all right. In Revelation 18, two, which I just had our sister Sophia, read it to us, all right? Great Babylon, which represents the kingdom of this world, all right? Um, Babylon was against God, all right? And it was the opposite of God. And when God finishes uh, with this world, which it, it's given its name as Babylon, it will become a habitation of demons, the hold of every unclean spirit, the hold or resting place of every unclean and hated bird, not the nice birds. Like the, the dove is a representative of the Holy Spirit, all right? But these are all demons. And th this is one of the reasons I, I, I'm, I'm not asking you to listen to me or do me, but because of this uh, studying all this and reading up on it, I have never 
wanted to uh, have like a collection of little frogs or big frogs. R remember where it says three unclean spirits come out of the mouth of the false prophet and so forth, uh, like frogs, frogs. Uh, I'm, if the frog represents unclean spirits, I don't want those things around my house. Well, here the owl, a lot of people have little owls, big owls, little owls. They have a collection of them. I don't want them. They all represent the creatures of darkness, the creatures of night. <clears throat> and even though they're used in picture form, I don't want anything in my house that represents same thing with dragons and phoenixes and all these things. I, I don't want if it's carved on something and I don't want that thing in my house. All right. So let, let's go here to Isaiah 34, verse 8 to 15, which we just read. The results of God's judgment were on page 50. All right confusion and emptiness. All right, confusion and emptiness. You see, when we listen to God, there is no confusion at all. When we listen to God, we get revelation knowledge. We understand we, there's purpose, there's reason, and so forth. But when there's confusion and emptiness it means there's no purpose no purpose at all all right and it's all given over to the evil ones god always has a purpose and a reason for everything whatever god allows is for a purpose but when we listen to the lies of the enemy it's to bring us to a place of total confusion and no purpose in life everything is empty all right <clears throat> the characteristics of the nature of these birds they're birds of prey killing and devouring feeding on that which is already dead they are birds who are lovers of darkness. Now, I listed all of these uh, birds, like over in on page 49, creatures of the night, cormorant, bittern, the owl, the raven. All right. So I have gone through and I went to Strong's Concordance and I named each of these and looked them up. And I even gave the numbers. This is under Strong's Concordance, not any other concordance. They all have their own numbers. <clears throat> but these numbers come from Strong's Concordance. You want to go and look it up yourself. The coramant means to vomit, to spew out to throw down, to cast down, to hurl. Now, I found through these names and their meanings, many of them, uh, all of them have to do with when we do deliverance with people and uh, some of the things, their outward manifestations, you know, um, this is what happens when you start doing um, deliverance, when people start really demons coming out of them. Sometimes you don't see anything, but other times you see it. Uh, and one of the things is to vomit. They start vomiting, all right, throwing up. That's why when I do deliverance with people, I ask them to please um, fast fast one or two meals before we do the deliverance. <clears throat> so if there's this 
vomiting, it, it, it's a lot easier, all right? Then the bittern, <clears throat> it means to contract or roll together, all right? And this also is seen. People will do funny things. They will, you know, different shapes. They, they, all right. And to cut off, that's what it means. Owl, it is an unclean aquatic bird. Aquatic means uh, water, all right. Unclean, it's unclean. The screech owl, it's a night specter a twist away from the light, i.e. night, all right? Figuratively, adversity. That, that's what the meaning of screech owl is, all right? <clears throat> the great owl to contract, to spring forward, an arrow snake as darting on its victims. The ossifras, a claw, to break in pieces. And really, it represents satanic powers, all right? <clears throat> the eagle, to lacerate, to tear apart. A large bay bird of prayer, prey. I don't know what's the matter with me. A large bird of prey. <clears throat> the vulture to dart, to fly rapidly. And we know the vultures, if, if something's getting ready to die, they will all come and sit around there just waiting to be able to pounce <clears throat> on that dead body and start eating on it. None of these things speak of good. <clears throat> None of these things are things that we would want. Or they're representing the dark domain, the raven, dark, dusty, dusky night. Again, the pelican vomiting to spew out. The heron <clears throat> is also an aquatic bird to be enraged, breathe hard, angry, displeased. And this is what happens when people are going through deliverance. They start breathing heavily and they get very angry. And, you know, the, these are all pictures of demonic spirits and what they do to us. All right. So when God finishes, it, there's nothing left but for the unclean spirits to take over and people will end up in hell that that's the whole thing that's going what it's saying now let's finish these last two verses the divine guarantee to israel 16 and 17 don't start yet i want to find my place um okay in fact, read, it says 16 and 17, yeah. Isaiah 34, 16 and 17. Seek ye out of the book of the Lord and read. No one of these shall fail, none shall want her mate. For my mouth it hath commanded, and his spirit it hath gathered them. And he hath cast the lot for them and his hand hath divided it unto them by line. They shall possess it forever. From generation to generation shall they dwell therein. So this is God's divine guarantee to Israel. God prom God's promises will never fail. All right. So go get God's word and read it. And you will see. Once God commands something, God tells it to happen, it's going to happen. God's spirit will gather them. They will come back, you know, talking about the children of Israel because it says the divine guarantee to Israel, all right? He has promised them, though he dispersed them 
to different countries of the world, he will draw them back. Of course, he's already begun that work. Uh, Israel is already beginning to be inhabited and um, it, it's quite a lovely place, all right? They will come back to their own land. Uh, he has cast the lot for them. His hand hath divided it unto them. In other words, way back there, he said it would be theirs and it's going to be theirs, even though because of disobedience for many centuries and for the way they <clears throat> treated Jesus for many centuries, they've been scattered, but the bringing them back has already started to come. God's promises to them, they're going to possess it forever. Of course, all this will take place at the end, right after this um, battle of Armageddon, because when everything is finished, we're told very clearly, the earth will have very few people left. Right now, there's a movement, you know, wanting to deplete this earth's uh, civilization because uh, they, they want to kill them off. They want to, um, you don't need to worry about it. God will take care of that. By the time his judgment is finished, it says it'll be like a fig tree that you shake it and all the figs fall down and there's one, there's one, there's one. So few people will be left <clears throat> in the whole of the world to start in on the millennial reign. <clears throat> but after a thousand years of righteous rulership, people will multiply and people will not be so ready to die because they're going to live longer and in a thousand years this world will be full of people again all right um and israel god's children are promised to be in rulership Okay, um, I don't think we should start chapter 35. I thought we would finish that, but we will do 35 next time. And from 35, we will go directly into the interlude. Uh, that's 36, 37, 38. 36 to 39, all right, we will start on that because right now it's a quarter to 11 and we won't get that far even though there's only 10 verses. Well, I don't know, 10 verses, Let, let's go ahead and see, I would like to finish it. Let's go to Isaiah 35. Why don't you read for us verse one and two? Uh, you know, just like, um, we said that 34 was a terrible thing, all right? And we find out that 35 is a very beautiful chapter, all right? Let, let, let's go ahead and read it. And um, Isaiah 35, verse 1 and 2. Yeah. The wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the, as the rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given unto it, the excellency of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord and the excellency of our God. Yeah. So the manifestation of the Lord comparing these two chapters 
it says 34 is one of the darkest with a frightful carnage as Jehovah wreaks vengeance. 35 is one of the brightest and most joyful, revealing the glory of the Lord and his excellence. <clears throat> According to these first two verses, the land of Palestine is going to be changed physically and climatically to welcome its redeemer, all right, and the redeemed at the second advent when he actually comes down, his feet touch uh, the Mount of Olives, it splits totally in half, all right, and after that great terrible thing of the Battle of Armageddon, then we see that Jesus will come back. It says it is poetically personified. The desert shall rejoice with joy and singing. Uh, that, that means po poetically, in poetry, all right, it's made like the desert and um, this area is made as if they were human beings, all right, personified, like they're persons. So it says they shall rejoice with joy and singing. But actually, uh, what it's speaking of are the people there as well as the area, all right? This also portrays what happens when sin and the oppressor is broken in our lives, when God's spirit moves in our lives. Would you read three to seven for us? Isaiah 35, verse three to seven. Strengthen ye the, limp, the weak hands and confirm the feeble knees. Say to them that are of a fearful heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, even God with a recompense, and he will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as an heart, and the tongue of the dumb sing. For in the wilderness shall waters break out, and streams in the desert. And the parched ground shall become a pool, and the thirsty land springs of water, in the inhabitation of dragons, where each lay shall be grass with reeds and rushes. Yeah, so this is really showing the, the change that is going to take place, all right? B, retrospect upon the tribulation. The command is given to encourage the weak and the fearful to tide them through the darkness that precedes the dawn to encourage them to look up to their God. <clears throat> it's gonna be a terrible time because during the Antichrist period, <clears throat> He is totally against the Jew, and he is going to go after them, all right? And this portion of Isaiah, written thousands of years before it really takes place, is warning them, but helping them, so when that time comes, <clears throat> they'll keep their eyes on God, encouraging them, to look up to God, all right? So the words of encouragement are strengthen the weak hands, all right? Help those. If you are strong at that, not you. I hope none of us are there at that time, but whoever is living at that time, <clears throat> for them to help those that are weaker. And I think this is good uh, advice to all of us. If we think of others and look after them and help them, it will strengthen ourselves as well. All right, if we only think of ourselves, we give in to our fear, it's not going to help confirm the feeble needs. The, this could be referring to walking, but I see it in a spiritual realm. Uh, they, they need to be told, get on your knees and cry out to the Lord. It represents prayer. 
as far as I can see. All right. The assurance that Messiah King is coming and he will come to punish Israel's enemies, to reward and deliver his own, to work miracles in men's bodies and souls. All right. And to affect wonders in nature. Uh, things are going to change totally, completely. I don't expect to be here as part of the people on earth. I expect to be part of that army that comes with the Lord. And I pray you expect the same thing. If we are in Christ, then whatever he does, we're with him. But he gets the credit. It's him doing it. But we're with him. We're one with him. All right. Um, and so this is really going back and helping people in that last day uh, that they might be able to go through that terrible time when Antichrist, the three and a half years that Antichrist is really out to destroy anybody that loves God. All right. That their only hope is in God to keep their eyes on God and let God do the fighting for them. Let's read those last two verses, 8 to 10. Isaiah 35, 8 to 10. And an and highway shall be there and a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. And the unclean shall not pass over it but it shall be for those, the wayfaring men, though fools shall not err therein. No lion shall be there, any ravious beast shall go up thereon, shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk on there. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Yeah. So I, I really return of the redeemed remnant to Zion. But this, you and I can take comfort in this. All, we can learn from all of this, even though it's talking about down there. All right. Knowing that, <clears throat> therefore, we can live our life now. Uh, to prevent us from arriving at that time, we can take the different principles that are given to them and apply them to our own life right now. All right. And this is showing us clearly that God has a way <clears throat> that he calls the highway. It's like these freeways that are built way up there above cities. You get up there. And you can, they're over the tops of trees, over the tops of big buildings and so forth. They're, they're above everything. And he says his highway is called the highway of holiness. This is showing us the way to walk and stay above the powers of darkness. All right. God is a holy God. And he said, be ye holy, for I am holy. So the only way to God is the highway of holiness. That is to cry out, acknowledge our life is sinful, repent of it, become born again, and then walk on this highway of holiness. All right. That is the only road that's going to end up with God is the highway of holiness. You cannot accept the Lord, become born again, and then go back to living your own self-centered life, pleasing yourself, giving in to your fleshly um, desires, fleshly ways, mannerisms. No, that does not end up with God. And I've told you that story many a time <clears throat> that when I got so upset with my husband about something, we didn't agree together. I ran off and I was driving at nighttime in the 
whether it was a van or a car, I don't remember now. But God said to me, where are you going? Now, I was already a missionary in Singapore. All right. I was born to missionary parents in China. Now, I have answered the call. So definitely, I was born again. And I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. And I'm a missionary and a missionary's wife. But that night, I became very angry. And I left and got in the car and drove off in anger. When I got up to uh, Upper Serangoon Road, <clears throat> a voice spoke to me. I was alone in the car or vehicle. Where are you going? And I answered out loud, I don't know where I'm going. And the voice said, I said, where are you going? And I answered, I told you, I don't know where I'm going. And the voice said, are you going to heaven or are you going to hell? And I began to laugh from anger. I began to laugh because you see your, your flesh doesn't know how to be reverent, doesn't know how to have the fear of God. No, I started to laugh and I said, of course, I'm going to heaven. Who would be fool enough to choose to go to hell? And the voice said to me, you are going in the wrong direction. Now you get this car turned around, you get back to your husband, and don't you dare do this again. In other words, what God was saying, you want to choose the road of the flesh and still think you're going to make it to heaven? No, the end of flesh. If you continue walking that road, it leads you to hell. The end of it is destruction. God was warning me, don't just think that you're my child and because you're my child, you can do whatever you want. No, if you're my child, you walk within, you know, in accordance to my word. And the Bible says, be angry and sin not. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Don't make room for the devil. All right. So the highway of holiness is the way of safety protection it's the way of the redeemed <clears throat> and when we are on that road it says that the joyful return they shall come with songs all right the ransomed of the lord in fact verse 9 says no lion shall be there <clears throat> the lion not representing jesus but the lion representing that unclean spirit that wants to destroy us because it says, or any ravenous beast. On the highway of holiness, you don't have to worry about demonic things getting you. All right. They won't be there. Only the redeemed walk on that highway of holiness. They have been ransomed by the Lord, and they're on their way back to the Lord with songs. They're not trying to get joy and gladness. They shall obtain it. It is a promised thing. If we stay on that highway of holiness, all right, we shall obtain joy and gladness all right and there will be no more sorrow and sighing shall flee away and this is what i've said i've learned from this verse when i hear myself going ah yeah ah yeah that oh be careful be careful because the highway of holiness you don't have the sighing anymore that is part of the flesh life. So let's learn. Let's not just know these verses to read them and to be able to say where they're found in the Bible. That's all good. 
but let's apply them to our life. Amen. That, you know, if we are on this highway of holiness, praise the Lord, then that chapter 34 is not for us. And if we understand this, we can teach this to others and help them to avoid being caught under the anger of God, the indignation of God, but rather that we will be his children, his ransom, his redeemed, and we will stay on that highway of holiness till we see him face to face. Okay, let us um, bow our heads, close our eyes, and when we come back next Saturday, we will start with the historical parenthesis of chapter 36 to 39. Spirit of the living God, breathe upon each and every one of us, Lord. I thank you for those that attended the class today. I pray, though, that as they hear the things, they've heard them before, they won't just let it go in one ear and out the other, but that each of us might take it very personally. God's vengeance and God's wrath is a real thing, but he doesn't want it for those of us that he has called out of this world into his light but we have to abide in the light. We have to abide on that highway of holiness till we see you face to face. Lord, may we pray for those around us that the light will shine into their heart and life. And if need be, that it will come to them via our mouth, via our life, living the life in front of them that will speak to their hearts. Lord, may we not live for ourselves, but may we live for you and seek your face that each and every person that should be saved will come to know you and that we will not be a hindrance, but that our life will be a blessing to them, a stepping stone to them to help them find their way to you. I thank you and I praise you. Those that are in the class, I pray that they will take each and everything that we've learned today and apply it to their own life. In Jesus' name, amen. Bye-bye. God bless.